this lecture, we will go over many examples that make use of Newton's second law. However, we will restrict ourselves to a special set of examples. We will only look at motion along a line or at objects at rest. So, for example, we will be avoiding general projectile motion and circular motion. When contact forces are present, at least one of the solid bodies involved will have a flat surface touching the other object, so that a vector normal to the surface can be defined. We will ignore air friction, except in cases where it makes no sense to ignore it, like when dealing with parachutes. Finally, all our examples will take place near the surface of the Earth. Our first example involves an horizontal applied force exerted on a ball. The mass of the ball is given, the motion is horizontal, and friction is neglected. We start with a free body diagram. Here is the ground and the ball of mass M. An horizontal applied force is exerted on the ball. This motion is happening at the surface of the Earth, so a gravitational force is present. The ball is touching the ground, so a normal force is present, perpendicular to the ground. And since the friction is neglected, we do not need to worry about the friction part of the contact force. Here is the set of preference direction that we will use. The direction of x hat is chosen as to be the same as the applied force. Our givens include the mass of the ball, the x component of the applied force, and since the resulting motion is said to be horizontal, the vertical component of the acceleration is zero. Finally, I am repeating the fact that the friction force is neglected. Let us start with Newton's second law as it applies to the x component. Our free body diagram indicates that the only force with an x component is the applied force, so we can replace the x component of the net force with the x component of the applied force. Isolating for ax gives this. The next step is to substitute the givens and use a calculator to arrive at 19 meters per second square for the x component of the acceleration. Therefore, an evaluation of the average acceleration is 19 meters per second square x hat or 19 meters per second square forward, since the acceleration does not have a vertical component. Our next example involves a skydiver falling from rest. We want to find his mass from his acceleration and the magnitude of the air friction force acting on him at some point in his fall. So here is our skydiver. The force of gravity is acting on him. And since air friction is not assumed to be negligible, we have to consider it. Air friction acts in the opposite direction to the velocity. So since the skydiver is falling, the air friction is upward. The motion is along the vertical line and all the forces are parallel to that line, so there is no reason for two reference directions. We will use only x hat, chosen as the upward direction. With this reference direction, the x component of the air friction force is positive and the acceleration is negative. We again start with Newton's second law expressed for the x components. There are only two forces that made up that net force, so the x component of the net force is the sum of the x component of the gravitational force and the air friction. Replacing the x component of the gravitational force with minus mg gives this. Since we want to evaluate the mass, we collect together the terms that involve the mass. And next, we isolate the mass. We reach the stage where we can supply the numerical values of the givens, using as well the constant value for g at the surface of the Earth. The use of a calculator leads to 
65.4 kilogram, which is our final answer for the mass of the skydiver. The next examples will involve contact forces. It is time to investigate how to quantify these forces. There are two types of friction forces, the kinetic friction force and the static friction force. The normal part of a contact force must not be zero in order to have friction forces of either type. In other words, the two objects need to be touching. The difference between the two types of friction forces comes from whether the objects are sliding against each other or not. If there is sliding, the kinetic force is present. If there is no sliding, the static friction force might be present. A word of warning. Some introductory textbooks base the difference between the two types of friction forces on whether the object you are interested in is moving or not. This is misleading. In cases of static friction, the objects are not sliding against each other. The static friction force takes the magnitude and the direction necessary to prevent the sliding. The kinetic friction force, on the other hand, appears when the objects are sliding against each other and the direction of the friction force will be in opposition to the sliding. Let us start with quantifying the static friction force. It will take the value that would ensure that the surface is touching will not slide as long as this static friction force stays within a certain range. The lower limit of the range is zero and occurs when no friction is required to keep the objects from sliding against each other. For example, take a book lying at rest on a table. A gravitational force acts on the book and the table exerts a normal force to stop the book from going through the table. These two forces are vertical and cancel each other out, leading to a net force of zero. There is no horizontal force involved so there is no need for a static friction force to be present to prevent the sliding. But if an applied horizontal force is present, the book would slide along the table if there was no friction present. To prevent the sliding, a static friction force will appear that will need to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the applied force. This would again result in a net force of zero, and there would not be any sliding. However, if you keep increasing the applied force, you will eventually reach a point where the sliding occurs. So, the static friction has reached a point where it can no longer prevent the sliding. It has reached a maximum value, Fs max. We now have a mechanism to evaluate the static friction force, but how do we quantify the upper limit of its range, this point where we change from a case of static friction to one of kinetic friction? Experimentally, it is found that the maximum magnitude of the static friction force is proportional to the magnitude of the normal force. So we have that Fs max equals mu s times Fn where mu s is the constant of proportionality in this relationship. Mu s is known as the coefficient of static friction. This relationship involves the magnitude of the two components of the contact force at the critical transition between not sliding and sliding. It is not a vectorial equation. The friction force is still perpendicular to the normal force. This relationship shows that the greater the value of the normal force, the greater the deformation of the surfaces involved to create a repulsive force between the surfaces, the greater it will also prevent the sliding of the objects along the surfaces. The coefficient of static friction is not a universal constant. It depends on the two types of material that are touching. The value is found experimentally. For example, if one object is made of steel and the other one is ice, think skates on ice here for a mental image, we have a mu s equal to 
0.03. It means that the static friction force cannot go beyond 3% of the normal force. This is a small range of values, and skating does not require much force from you to start sliding. On the other hand, the combination of rubber and concrete leads to a coefficient of static friction of 1, and the static friction force can take out values over a wide range. Think here of car tires on roads or sole of shoes on sidewalks. You rely on the static friction force to be able to walk or run. Notice here that you are moving while walking and it is a static friction force that helps you do so. During a normal walk, the sole of your shoes are not sliding against the floor. Finally, a mid-value for the coefficient of static friction occurs with wood on wood. It has a value of 0 0.40. Think of a crate that needs to be pushed along a wooden floor. You would need to exert an horizontal force over 40% of the magnitude of the weight of the crate to dislodge the crate from its resting place. This example involves a situation that we had already encountered while defining free body diagrams. It is the good old book being held at rest against a wall by an horizontal applied force. But this time, we want to get the value of the smallest horizontal force that would stop the book from sliding down the wall. Let us review the free body diagram of the situation. Here is the wall, the book, and the applied force. The force of gravity is present, and the contact force consists of the normal force and the static friction force. The static friction force is necessary here because otherwise the gravitational force would pull the book downward and there would be sliding. We will use this system of reference directions. Our givens are the mass of the book, the coefficient of static friction, and since the book is to be kept at rest, the acceleration is zero. Let us start with Newton's second law expressed for the X component. Two forces are involved, the applied force and the normal force, and the X component of the acceleration is zero. Comparing the vectors to the reference direction gives this, which leads to the magnitude of the applied force being equal to the magnitude of the normal force. Next, we do the same thing to the Y components. Vertically, the two forces involved are the static friction force and the gravitational force. The fact that the Y component of the acceleration is zero is also used here. We then replace the Y component of the gravitational force with minus mg. And we next conclude that the magnitude of the static friction force equals the magnitude of the gravitational force. To find the minimum applied force, we need to make use of the condition for the maximum value of the static friction force. Using the result from the Y component balance and the formula for the maximum static friction force, we can write this. Next, we use the result from the X component balance. Isolating for FA gives this. Substituting the givens gives this. The use of a calculator leads to 23 Newton, which is the lowest value for the applied force. So the final answer is minus 23 Newton x hat. In this lecture, we barely had the time to study one example involving the static friction force. However, we need to move on to the quantification of the kinetic friction force before giving examples that would include both types of friction. This will be the subject of the next installment.